My name is Stefan Deschain, and I'm the host of The Nature's Living Show. And my name is Samantha Graham, and I'm the podcast's producer. This is the YouTube version of the podcast. We make it available here for those who prefer this format. But podcasts are much more convenient when you subscribe and listen on a podcast app. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Stitcher, Deezer, Overcast, and many, many other places. Please visit naturistlivingshow.com for more information. But for now, enjoy this YouTube version of our podcast. On this episode of the Naturist Living Show, a performance of Barely Proper. This episode of the Naturist Living Show is brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. At Bear Oaks, we offer traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Free your body, free your mind. www.bearoaks.ca In episode 31... Um, I talked about a nude play that we attended. Uh, the performers were nude most of the show, and of course the audience was nude too, which was a lot of fun. And I also talked about a little bit of the history of uh, naturist and nudist theater and nude theater, and I quoted uh, fairly extensively um, from a book called Theater au Naturel, a collection of naturist play by Mark Story. And I quoted Mark Story talking about a play called Barely Proper, because that play has a tremendous history it was written in 1931 as an unplayable play because having nude people on stage in 1931 was uh, unthinkable and wouldn't have happened. But it was taken up by the naturist community quite quickly. Um, and in the 60s and 70s in particular, it was performed quite extensively. And uh, it made a lot of money for uh, naturist clubs that were putting it on. It also introduced a lot of people because they could come dressed to see this play in a naturist setting. Um, and they could stay afterwards. And so a lot of people learned and were introduced and got a chance to visit a sort of open house, if you will, because of this play being put on by those naturist and nudist clubs. So I've always been fascinated by the history of this play, and I I wanted to uh, put it on uh, on this show. And I knew that uh, Leonard Lerman, who we've talked about before because he does naturist music, uh, Leonard and his wife Hélène, Leonard had done a radio adaptation of Barely Proper. Uh, radio play uh, is the way that plays used to be done before television. People would do plays on radio. Uh, storytelling, essentially, where you'd be so a bit like reading a book or like an audio book with sound effects and actors actually playing out the parts. That's what a radio play is, for those of you who are too young to remember. Well, actually, I'm too young to remember, too. I was I grew up in the age of television. But I've heard a number of radio plays over the years, and that style is actually coming back a bit. So I was I talked to Leonard, and he said, oh, yes, he'd love to do it. And uh, he said, why don't we do it at a naturist festival that was being held at Bear Oaks uh, this year in 2011? And I said, oh, I don't think we'll have time to find all the actors. We certainly wouldn't have time to practice ahead of time. So... I told him to come anyway, and we would sort of plan it out and think it through. So when he got here, he said, so did you find any actress? I said, no, I didn't have time. And, you know, it's been a very good summer, very busy, and I uh, certainly didn't have time to really get into it. Besides, we wouldn't have had time to practice. So he went to, uh, he got on the nude bus the first day of the festival, uh, ever since we've had it at Bear Oaks three, four years ago, I think. Uh, we've always had a nude bus that goes down to Hanlon's Point, which is the official uh, clothing optional or nude beach in the city of Toronto. So we get a uh, school bus, and we fill it with 40 people who uh, travel completely nude all the way down uh, because you get onto a ferry, which goes onto the island, downtown Toronto. Uh, and so basically you can get off the bus uh, right onto the nude beach. So we leave from Bear Oaks without clothes, and we don't bring clothes with us. We just bring a towel. And uh, this year, actually, there were two buses, so 80 people went down. Unfortunately, I had to miss it this year. But anyway, to make a long story short, while he was there, uh, Leonard managed to recruit uh, all the people he needed to do the play. 
and so the next day, Thursday, uh, we he came back, and we uh, he did a practice run in the morning with them. So they they had one practice, one maybe one and a half because they repeated a few lines, and then we recorded it. So the recording is pretty good. I only had one microphone because I wasn't prepared for actually recording the play. Uh, I didn't think we would be doing it, but much to my surprise, he managed to pull it all together, which is very exciting, and I'm actually fairly happy with the results. So keep in mind, the people are not very practiced. There was almost no rehearsal time, um, and there was, uh, you know, people, some were better actors than others, um, but uh, I think overall that the play has come out quite well. And so first, I'll let Leonard introduce it. Barely Proper by Tom Cushing was known as the unplayable play. It was written in the 1930s. It was published, but uh, not performed until a generation later. Uh, it was public domain, but it was adapted by a number of people, uh, including Ken McGuire, who wrote a, an adaptation called Grin and Barrett. And there were anonymous adaptations as well. Uh, Grin and Barrett actually ran uh, not only in several nature's and nudist places, uh, but also on Broadway for a very short time in 1969. It wasn't terribly well received uh, it was at the same time as Hare and Old Calcutta, and uh, it wasn't deemed sexy enough. It wasn't meant to be sexy. It was about naturism. Um, but it's a beautiful play that's been done in uh, nature's and nudist clubs, resorts for many, many years. And uh, the production that I directed uh, took a couple years uh, in the adaptation and in the rehearsal. Uh, it was done at P uh, Pocono Picnic for the Eastern Nature's Gathering in 1992. It was also recorded and broadcast on WBAI as a radio play on July 6th, 1992. And this is, I think, the, only the second time that this nude play on the radio has been heard uh, as uh, a radio play. <laughs> The time is June 1929, the place, the suburbs of Berlin. The scene is the drawing room of the Schmidt Villa on a warm afternoon. It is a beautiful room, very simple, done in the neo-Greek modernistic style. The walls are a warm Pompeian red with classical frieze. The sofa and chairs are Hellenic in treatment and covered with black satin. There is a grand piano at upper left. On it is a nude statue of the goddess Diana, dancing next to a vase of spring flowers. At her feet is a camera and guitar with a cerise ribbon. There is an ornamental screen in the corner to conceal the music shelves. At down right is a fireplace and a sofa running out from it that faces the audience. Behind the sofa is a table containing drinks and smoking gear. At the back, through a series of long, open, door-like windows, extends a terrace with a charming view of a high-walled garden or park beyond. The entrances are at upper right into the hall and at upper left into a sort of dressing room. The general atmosphere is one of austere refinement and seclusion, with a suggestion of money enough in the background to make it all possible. At rise, the door at right opens, and Diana Schmidt, a charming young girl of 18 to 20, smartly dressed in street clothes, enters and glances swiftly around the room. Normally outgoing, she is now withdrawn and quite nervous. She takes a quick look around the room, hurries to the exit stage right, closes the door, goes to the French doors and looks out. She steps for a moment through them, looking off to the left and right, comes back into the room and closes the doors. She looks around the room again and then notices the statue of Diana, pauses, goes to it, and turns her so that she is facing upstage. She goes to the center of the room, looks at the statue, shakes her head, returns to the statue and replaces her in her original position with an air of resignation. <sighs> she walks quickly to the door she first came in, pauses, crosses fingers on both hands, looks heavenward a moment, then opens the door. Come on in, Derek. Following her through the doorway comes Derek Leet, a callow Englishman. He is exceedingly personable in a nice, athletic way and is dressed in the effortless but thoroughly effective manner of a well-groomed young varsity Briton. 
It takes but one look to realize that, for all his attractive red-bloodedness, he is conventional to the core. He is humorous and a good sport only until he reaches the border of the things that aren't done. There, his sense of humor and adventure desert him abruptly. And about time, too. Why did you make me wait? Oh, I just wanted to make sure the house was... Agamemnon is so messy, leaves things lying around. I... You know. Can't imagine this room ever being messy. Beautiful. I had no idea. He pauses with a start as he suddenly notices the statue of Diana. He walks over to it cautiously. I had no idea, Diana, that you were... Uh, were uh, what? I had no idea I was marrying money. Uh, just because my father's a teacher. I suppose you expected the poor house. Well, he's a professor of classics. I, I didn't know. Lots of things about me you don't know. Darling. Please, Derek, not now. Why not? Can't think of a better time. You could have kissed me at the station. With all those people around? Diana. Oh, what's, what's out there? Oh, the usual. Mm -mm. Tennis courts, swimming pool, stables. The usual? Sure. Let's have a look. Not now, Derek. Just a peek. We don't have much time. Sensational. Nice high wall. I like privacy. So do we. Privacy and fresh air. It's like the country. Can't believe we're just outside Berlin. I'll show you the grounds later. Great. I thought you were such a fresh air fiend. I am, but I want to have a talk with you, Derek. We've a lifetime ahead of us for talks, dear. Strange. What? That statue. Diana, isn't it? Your namesake. Yes. Don't you feel a little, well, strange about, well, her, uh, you know, she's so unclothed. No. You don't? Well, she is beautiful. I can't deny that. Your parents must be very broad-minded. I must say, if mine saw this, outside of a museum, that is, they'd be quite upset. Oh, well, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? That's what I wanted to talk to you about. The Romans? No, not the Romans. Derek, we've never really talked about our families. I sensed a reluctance on your part, uh, so I didn't press it. Is that what's bothering you? Frankly, I'm scared to death, you and your parents. Well, that you... Oh, how do I start? My parents? Well, they're quite respectable. Father Of is... course they are. I'm not talking about your parents. Oh. Uh, yours, then. Well, from the looks of this room, I have nothing to worry about. So there's nothing to explain. I just hope they'll like me. I'm afraid you may not like them. Nonsense, Diana. I'm a pretty good judge of people, and this room does oh, reflect... Oh, this room? That's like saying clothes make the man. Well, don't they? <gasps> Derek... Aside from that one month at Oxford, you don't know a thing about me. Oh, you have a confession to make? Yes. Well, as long as you love me now, the past doesn't matter. I can overlook it. I'm not talking of the past. I'm talking of the present, of tea today. Whether to drop you into it, as it were, or warn you beforehand. Warn me? Oh, if I only could, if I only dared. Well, what's to prevent you? You! You're so hopelessly English. You wouldn't understand. You wouldn't make allowances. You're in love with someone else? No, it has nothing to do with my feelings for you. Then what is it? It has to do with life, Derek. Our way of living, of... of being. It's not what you expect. It's... well, it's not conventional. But, dearest... And if I'd warned you beforehand, you wouldn't have come. I just know it. And now that you're here, I'm afraid if I tell you, you'll run for the hills. Something you're ashamed of? It's something I'm proud of. Well, then what... Oh, could... Derek, if only you didn't shock so easily. Now, wait a minute. What sort of prize arse do you take me for? And what the heck was it would shock me that it wouldn't shock you? Just out of the egg, Diana. I have knocked around a bit, you know. Toured Europe uh, mm. with my mother. Mm. Uh, Diana, I spent a week in Paris <gasps> alone. Oh, Derek. And it's quite true what they say about Paris. Quite shocking. Just what I was saying, Derek. You're so easily shocked. Well, decency demanded it. Decency? 
Derek, do you remember that weekend we had down near Brighton when we all went swimming and you insisted on going in in the upper part of your bathing suit? Uh, oh, but darling, I wore bottoms too. I mean, uh, trunks. Not just the upper part. Oh, of course you wore trunks too. It's a wonder you didn't wear an overcoat and a hat. But why did you bother to wear a shirt? No other man did. Well, with you there, it wouldn't seem nice without. There you go. All your theories and standards about what's nice and proper. Don't tell me your family planned to appear in bathing costume for tea. No, they're certainly not planning any such thing. Oh, darling, I, I was only kidding. Of course they wouldn't wear bathing costumes in the house. I assure you they won't. But let's just suppose, for the sake of argument, they did. What then? <laughs> Don't be absurd. But tell me what it is that's worrying you. I can't. Why not? Because I'm a modern German and you're old English. Oh, rubbish. Trot out your family skeletons. I'll show you. Family skeletons <laughs> describe some of them better than you know. You'll see them soon enough. But I'd rather have you see them than to hear about them. You mean they believe in free love? That sort of thing? I'm used to that. Oh, I mean, I mean, I could overlook it. Bless you, darling. But it's much worse than that. Worse than... Worse than immorality? From your standpoint, yes. This belongs to the things that, well, that aren't done. For heaven's sake, tell me what you mean. No, I'm going to let you find out for yourself. You act as though they committed murder or cheated at cards or something. Worse than that, to an Englishman. I'm not going to tell you anything more. Only this, to me and my family, it's the most beautiful theory in the world. On how you react to it, our future depends. I told them you were one of us. One of what, dearest? That you will soon know. If you love me, you've got a chance to prove it now. But, sweetheart, I can't see why you're so frightfully melodramatic of a mere tea party. After all, I'm only meeting your relatives for tea. I'm sure they're all right. <laughs> Must be being yours. Why, darling, even if they prove to be cannibals... For your sake, I'd swallow them without turning a hair. I believe you'd try. And you won't give me an inkling of what this test is going to be? Of perhaps feeling ridiculous. The hardest thing that an Englishman can bear. I'll be right back. I'm going to get ready for tea. When you see me next, dear, the test will be on. But I am... Now, a... Better fix yourself a good stiff drink, dear. You're going to need it. She exits at left. Derek stands a moment, completely baffled. He walks back into the room, thinking heavily, but getting nowhere. He wanders over to the statue of Diana and looks at her a moment. She sounds so damn serious. He goes to the bar and begins to fix himself a drink. He pours the whiskey in, pauses, looks towards where Diana left the room, then pours another shot into the glass, laces it with soda, swirls the glass around, walks to the French doors, opens them wide, and stands looking out for a moment, sipping his drink. He returns to the center of the room, still thinking heavily. The statue of Diana keeps bothering him. He walks over to her again, looks around the room quickly, and, being careful about where he touches the statue, he primly faces her towards the corner of the room. He returns to the center of the room, looks at her, and is satisfied. He has done the right thing. Then through the French doors rolls a tennis ball, slowly, as if of its own volition. It stops right at his feet. Derek follows its progress as if mesmerized. Then suddenly, swiftly, almost a blur, what appears to be a naked man shoots across the terrace by the open doors and vanishes. Derek jumps at the sight, then rubs his eyes. <sighs> God. He takes a quick gulp of his drink. Ooh. Then, bounding into the room, comes Agamemnon, Diana's handsome, athletic, beautifully tanned brother, carrying a tennis racket. He is stark naked. He is looking around the floor and doesn't see Derek. He spots the ball. There you are. He stoops to pick it up and then sees Derek's feet and legs. He rises slowly and looks at Derek. Derek steps back and... They stare at each other for a moment. Then Agamemnon breaks into a big smile. 
Hello there! You must be Derek. Didn't know you'd arrived. Catch! He tosses the ball and Derek manages to catch it. He looks at it, then at Agamemnon, and puts it down like a hot potato. Uh, uh yes. <laughs> I'm your about-to-be brother-in-law, Agamemnon. Oh, um, how do you do, uh, playing ball, eh? Tennis, the other two are still on the court. We're practicing serves. Boy, Heinrich has some shot. A little uncontrolled, but when he masters it, wow. I'll join you in a spot. Good crossing? Amazing. Oh, oh I mean, uh, yes, quiet. Heinrich thinks it won't be long before trains will be obsolete. Says everybody will be flying. Nothing would surprise me. Where's Diana? Oh, she felt hot, uh, gone to wash up for tea. She said it was almost time. So it is. Well, here's to the engagement. Oh, uh, well, thanks awfully. Don't you want to get ready for tea? I was just wondering that about you. No hurry. Diana's told us all about you. We're glad to have you join the family. Oh, well, thanks awfully. I must admit we were a bit worried at first, but when Diana said that you were one of us... Oh, uh, yes, uh, um, <laughs> extraordinary suntan you have there. Oh, this is nothing. <laughs> Wait till you see Heinrich. Oh, but aren't you afraid someone might come? Oh, lots are coming. Mother, father, Aunt Minna, and of course Heinrich and Mitzi. But they'll be here any moment. Yeah, you really ought to think about getting ready. But don't worry. I know the schedule of the house. There's plenty of time for a shower. Shower? Have to finish our drinks first. Well, I suppose you know what you're doing, but... Uh... Diana says you broke the 100-meter record last month at Oxford. Oh, I run a bit. Bounce along, you know. Bounce, you are modest. Oh, um, oh I'm sorry. I'm, I'm rather ticklish. Looks as though you keep fit. Diana says you strip awfully well. Diana said? Oh, well, she saw me run at Oxford, and, well, a singlet and shorts do flatter one. But it's funny she spoke of it. Spoke of it? She raved. She said your deltoids were superb. My deltoids? She's never seen them. I mean... What's a deltoid and where are they? The shoulder muscle. <laughs> there they come now, Heinrich and Mitzi. Come in here. Mitzi, for heaven's sake, had you better do something about it. Do something? What do you mean? What do I mean? I should think of a rather obvious angle. Oh, my God! In through the door at right comes Katinka, the maid, with a tea tray on a tea wagon. She wears a cap, <laughs> but that is all she wears, except for a very sheer apron and a pair of French high-heeled shoes. Her manner is brisk and efficient. Should I put the tray over here, sir? Yes, Katika. I think that's where Mother wants it. Very good, sir. We usually have coffee and cake at this time. But today, in honor of you, we're having tea as well. I'm afraid we've never risen to the heights of tea. All this is wasted on Derek, who is in total shock now unable to take his eyes off Katinka. She straightens up from the table and moves across the room towards the kitchen. She is like a magnet to Derek, who half stumbles his way after her until she exits, closing the door after her. Derek stands a moment looking at the closed door, then turns and walks slowly, stiffly, back to Agamemnon. Did, did you see what I saw? What is it, old man? Well, that... That extraordinary apparition. Oh, that's Katinka, the maid. She is something, isn't she? Oh, God. Dear fellow, sit down. Is anything the matter? What did that girl have on? Practically nothing. Thank heaven. I mean, I thought I was seeing things. Oh, the apron. Have to explain that. She says without it, how can newcomers to the house know what she is? Oh, uh, yes, uh, whatever. She's a charter member of the club. Heinrich, you are silly. <laughs> <laughs> My God, someone's coming. Good. They'll be late if they don't hurry. But hadn't you better do something about it? Do something? What do you mean? Through the French doors come bounding Mitzi and Heinrich carrying tennis rackets. They, like Agamemnon, are naked, athletic, healthy, beautiful specimens of the human race. They are occupied with jostling each other and laughing and do not notice Agamemnon and Derek. They begin to exit into the shower room. We'd better hurry. We'll be late. 
Hey, wait a minute, you two. We've got company. I want to present the new addition to our family, Derek Leet. Oh, hello there. Didn't know you arrived. May I present my fiancé, Henrik. Awfully glad to meet you. Congratulations. Hey, you better hurry. You know how Mother hates us to be late. Beat you to the shower. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Diana? Undressing, I suppose. Diana? Aren't you coming? You don't even mean to tell me that Diana would allow... Uh, allow uh, what? Uh, that she would allow... Uh, that she would let herself be seen. Uh, that, that she would go... Go where? Go Starco too? <laughs> Why not? Why not? Because she's too... Or too nice. To be natural, you act as though you weren't in sympathy with us. Oh, I get it. Just your British humor. You were pulling my leg. But here she is now. Through the door at left comes Diana. She enters like a goddess, although her face is pale and she is nervous. She is stripped for the fray, but there is no shyness. She is doing the right thing. She is not long in doubt as to what Derek's rather Victorian reactions will be. Tired of waiting, Derek? Diana! Hello, sis. We like him a lot, but it's getting late. You better come along with me, Derek. Go on, Agamemnon. I want to speak to Derek first. Okay. Join us when you're ready. We'll all be in the shower. <laughs> well, now you know. A naked cult. You belong to a naked cult. One of those terrible things I've read of but never thought possible. Yes, and I'm proud of it. I've been brought up to go like this all my life, but now you see why I didn't dare tell you. It's a nightmare. You of all people. Oh, wake up, Derek. Of course I know it's something of a shock, but just be calm and you'll soon get used to Never. it. Never. The whole world's gone upside down. Derek, I plunged you into this on purpose, before your Anglo-Saxon prejudices had a chance to work. I ask you, have you seen anything yet that was the least bit improper? Have I seen anything that wasn't? Your brother naked as a jaybird, the maid sauntering in here like ladies' day at a Turkish bath, your friends Missy and Heine, or Heinrich, certainly the most astonishing couple in all Christendom, and you, most of all, you marching around in your birthday suit as if it were the most natural thing in the world. My God, Diana, now would you mind slipping into something so that I can talk to you in peace? Of course I would. This is the way we dress at tea. Dress? It is our custom, Derek. Do you mean to say you object that you don't like me this way? Well, of course I do. Uh, that's why I don't. What a very English reason. But is it logical to accept only the top 12 inches of me and reject the rest? Logic's got nothing to do with it. Parading around like a flock of lady good divers. At least she had the decency to appear shy. We don't parade. Wouldn't surprise me if you did. Diana, there is such a thing as modesty, decency. Decency, modesty, shame of the human body, the most beautiful thing in the world, and false modesty, born of the combined efforts of a tyrannical prude named Queen Victoria and the hypocrisy of the Puritans who thought happiness itself was a sin. And if Papa heard any of your... Your little fig leaf thoughts, he'd throw you out of the house. I think that's rather uncalled for. <laughs> little fig leaf thoughts. All I know is I can't take you seriously emoting in that costume. Why, even Sarah Bernhardt couldn't get away with it. You and your damned English humour again. Better take my handkerchief, darling, and blow your nose. <laughs> that's one trouble with your cult. No place for a handkerchief. Here, take mine. <laughs> You know, of course, that this is the end. The end? We might as well speak different languages. It's no use going on. You'd better leave before the rest of them come. The engagement's broken. Broken? Not on your life. My darling, you can't mean that. But I do, absolutely. Derek, we could never make a go of it. I see that now. We're too different. Rot. If you think I'll give you up as easy as this, you're jolly well mistaken. Well, you'll jolly well have to, because I'm not going to have you around here despising us, looking down on us, spoiling the atmosphere. But I love you, darling, in spite of your radical theories. 
but do you love me enough to try and see the common sense in them and not just stare at us through your distorted Anglo-Saxon glasses and condemn? Um, yes, if you really want me to. And if you can't see it our way, do you love me enough to hide it from the family and not hurt their feelings? Yes, uh, I promise. I, I absolutely promise. I'll try to be unbiased and open-minded. There, cross my heart. Now you kindly unbreak our engagement. There's one thing more. Oh, very well. What is it? Go into that undressing room and get ready for tea. I? You don't mean that I I should... certainly do. You can't judge things by merely looking at them. You've got to try them out. Just as you can't test flying by standing on the ground. You must actually do it. You're suggesting that I meet your family without a rag on my back? Stark over tea? Oh, my God, Diana, I couldn't. Then we're right back where we started. Be reasonable. You're all used to it. I'm not. There's got to be a first time for anything. Oh, Derek, once you've broken the ice, it'll never bother you again. <laughs> That's a beautiful thought, but... Uh, oh, I, I say, what about doing about degrees? Uh, Shirts today and shorts tomorrow. Don't be ridiculous. All or nothing. Besides, they expect it of you. I told them you were one of us. How would it look? I don't know how it would look, but I know how I'd feel. Damn conspicuous. You'd only be conspicuous if you're dressed. I'm such a silly ass. Then you won't do this little thing for me. Little thing? Well, there's nothing more to say. You'd better go. You make this an issue? Yes, because it's fundamental. Go, Derek, before the others get here. Very well, I'll... Goodbye. I'll go and get ready for tea. <gasps> Derek, do you mean it? If you can stand it, so can I. You'll see, Derek. I wouldn't insist, darling, if I wasn't sure it was the only way to bring us all together. The all together? I say, what about shedding behind that screen? I'm not quite up to facing that mixed shower room of yours yet. If you'd rather, but you'd better hurry. Before I lose the nerve I wish I had. No, before the others get here. It'll be easier for you if you're undressed. That statement has just destroyed 5,000 years of civilization. Derek! <laughs> I, was, I was only kidding. I know now just how the early Christian martyrs felt before they met the lions. Your father and mother have arrived. Thank you, Katinka. Yes, miss. What are you thinking, dear? Of my zero hour, so rapidly approaching, when I've got to go over the top in nothing. <laughs> Here come Mama and Papa. Aren't you ready enough to come out so we can meet them together? Stay where you are. I'll be out soon. How far have you got? Too far to tell you. Hurry, Derek. Professor Perseus von Schmidt and his wife, Frau Elise Schmidt, enter grandly. They are beautifully tanned, well-preserved specimens. They are totally nude, except that Frau Schmidt wears a lorgnette hung on a gold chain with here and there a pearl. Ah, oh, Diana! Well, where is he, your beloved? Undressing, Papa, behind the screen. The screen? But why not in the undressing room? Um, he wanted to be near me. How romantic. The professor notices the statue facing the wrong way and goes to it. What's this? He returns the statue to its proper position. Sometimes I don't understand Agamemnon's sense of humor. Well, hurry up, young man. Your mother-in-law and I long to see you in the flesh. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, delighted to meet you uh, uh, presently. You must be ready by now, Derek. Oh, um, uh, how do you do? Uh, oh, my God. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was just startled a bit. Uh, silly of me. Welcome to the family. Dear me. Don't we look as you expected? No, dear mother-in-law, you far outstrip. Oh, I mean, exceed my expectations. Delighted to meet you. Nice head and shoulders. Come out, my boy, so we can shake hands with you. What's the matter, Derek? Come out. I, I, I seem to, to lack the initiative. Must admit, it occasionally used to happen to me when I met new people. Let me take the initiative for you. Oh, um, uh, oh, oh, how do you do? Uh, so sorry to have kept you waiting. Uh, a, a beautiful place you've got here. I've been admiring the garden. Ah, my boy, what a specimen, isn't he, my dear? Oh, very pretty. Oh. Well, she means pretty build, dear. 
Oh, Derek, I think you are stunning. Diana, please. Diana, you have done well. I commend to you. You have come to us direct from Greece. He is a poem, although a very wide poem. Stand over there, young man, where the light will hit you most. Oh, must I? Oh, I mean, uh, yeah, certainly. Diana, stand beside him. Yes, father. Wonderful, beautiful. You have picked him well. Not a pin feather left. Perfect couple, aren't they, dear? Yes. All you need now is a little sun and air. To complete the picture. Yes, I see what you mean. Sun and air? No hurry about that, is there? The sooner the better. You better ought to get busy about it. But not till after tea. But we're not married yet. Married? You don't believe in marriage either. I believe in sunbaths. What has marriage got to do with it? Just Derek's little joke. You were suggesting a little sun and air at once, and so he... Oh, very good. You have a sense of humor. Maybe English humor, but I don't think it's nice. Certain subjects should never be laughed at. Oh, I beg your pardon. I... I forgive you. I'm sure it was just a slip. Perseus, will you have coffee or tea? Coffee, my little rosebud. Sit down, my boy, and make yourself at home. Oh, thanks, sir. Oh, I'll sit over here, if I may, in the corner. Corner, nothing. The family want to see you. Oh, very well. I'll sit here, then, and trust to luck. Katinka solemnly carries in a tray loaded down with cakes of all kinds. No one pays the slightest attention to her, except Derek. He is still amazed at her. And how is the movement going in England, my boy? Uh, well... I was asking how Gymnosophia was progressing in England. Uh, oh, I, I beg your pardon, uh, Gymnosophia? That's all, Katinka. Very good, madam. I asked about the spread of Gymnosophia, a Gymnosophy, in England. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, my, my mind was wandering. You mean uh, nude thought, uh, starkoism, that sort of thing? Very nicely, thanks. Does your mother practice it in the home? Mother? Good Lord, no. Derek? Uh, oh, well, Mother doesn't uh, yet. Uh, not so as you'd notice it. Cigar? No, thanks. Derek? Oh, very well. I'll just put it here in my pocket. Oh, <laughs> I'll put it down here until after tea. Just as you say, this is Liberty Hall. How do you take your tea? I'll just sit here, thanks, and not take it. Derek? Oh, well, uh, two lumps and milk. Uh, thank you. The day of emancipation is coming fast, when man, everywhere, will shed his clothes and step forth forever from his cocoon. And what a beautiful day that will be. Let's hope so. Otherwise, the poor man will be so chilly. Derek, father's in earnest. Actually, so am I. Chilliness, I have always felt, was the great obstacle to the cause. It's lovely in June, but damnable in March. Here is your tea. Oh, uh, thank you. Oh, oh. Why, what's the matter? Oh, it's just, uh, just a kink. I get them occasionally. It'll, it'll be all right presently. A kink? You mean a cramp? Stand up, my boy, and I'll rub it out. Ease the contraction at once. On your feet. Oh, oh, oh no, no, thanks. Uh, oh, what do you know? It's gone. I get them like that. You know, now they're here. Uh, now they're not. I'm still holding your tea. Oh, um... I'll uh, give it to him. Oh, thanks. Bring it back if it isn't right. Oh, I like it any old way. Yo! Whatever is it? I slapped a little tea on him. Just on my leg. But the water's rather hot. Diana, take this napkin and mop him up. Mop. Oh, uh, not necessary. It was just a drop. It made me jump, that's all. Oh, my delicious. You know, Professor, I can't help thinking that at times like this, when one's having tea dropped on one, or when the mosquito's about, oh, it's snowing, how nice it is to have on a pair of trousers. I dare say I sound extreme, but that's how I feel. My boy, it is all a question of getting accustomed. Does your face suffer in cold weather? Does a Scotsman's knees... You see, your skin is soft from too much covering. It, until it's hardened, you can hug the stove. Nothing in our doctrines against that. A stove's the last thing I'd want to hug in this condition. Derek's really only trying to get your arguments, Father, to use back on the English. Uh, quite. My family, or uh, my country, Britannia, isn't ready to undress yet. That is, in toto. You see, aside from the physical reasons, such as cold weather and all... 
I'm afraid our tradition won't let us. What's tradition got to do with going as God intended? You don't really mean that God intended us to walk through Piccadilly like this? Why not? If God had wanted us to have clothes, we have been born that way. Isn't that right, my dear? Naive, perhaps, but true. My boy, nobody expects you to walk down your Piccadilly or anywhere else in the middle of winter with no clothes on. If you're cold, you dress. But why a person should dress in the middle of summer is beyond me. One is hot with no clothes on. The body must breathe. Well, I never thought of it like that. That's very good, my dear. You must put that in one of your lectures. My husband is a brilliant orator. My dear, that's all I've been saying for years. That's all there is to say, really. You see how simple it is. Have some cake? Uh, no, thanks. You'll hurt my feelings if you don't. I'll hurt my figure if I do. Oh, I mean, I'm dieting. I really am dieting, and I don't care for cake. Just as you say. Clothes make the man, they say. Piffle, I say. Clothe the man, and you restrict his body, stifle his mind. Oh, that's very good, too, dear. <clears throat> it takes nine tailors to make a man, they say. Piffle. It takes nine tailors to unmake him, stifle him, and ruin his health. If mankind can do such wonderful things in clothes, has it occurred to you what he could do out of them? No, I can't say it has. Clothes are the root of all evil. Diana, my little snowdrop, tea or coffee? Coffee today, please. I wonder why Aunt Minna is so late. Aunt Minna is undressing. I saw her. She came in the garden way. She has a cough. She will wear shawls. Do you realize, young man, that over 200,000 German, not to mention the Scandinavian peoples, nor the Czechoslovakian enthusiasts, are all doing at this very moment the thing you term ridiculous? Uh, you mean taking tea? Tea? No, taking sunbaths! Oh, but I never said that was ridiculous. I was merely telling you the obstacles in England. No sun and too much tradition. Personally, I think sunbaths are awfully jolly, even though I don't quite see the sense in taking them in the house. Just where you need them most, where the sun can't reach you. You want all the value from the air that you can get. Why, my boy, you've never breathed till you breathe with your whole body. Never eaten till you've eaten without a belt. I never wear a belt, only suspenders. Oh, good old suspenders. As one of your great English poets has said, to bulge at ease as nature planned, unhampered by confining band. Ah, that is eating. You'll agree after tea. Have some cake and bulge. Charming idea, but I'm not in a bulging mood. Diana, sweet, you'd better call the others. They must be dry by now. Yes, Mama. I hope you don't think me unsympathetic. I think it's marvellous what you've managed to shed... But in England, it's harder. Don't be discouraged, my boy. The dawn is at hand. The birth of truth, the death of sham. Fig leaves are falling. Fig leaves of every sort are falling on every side. Wouldn't mind having one fall on me just now. They're all coming. Oh, oh. Oh, I say, uh, there's a guitar. May I try it? Of course. Liberty Hall. Oh, thanks. Derek, you don't play the guitar. I know. I'm wearing it. But it will make you look so foolish. Not half as foolish as without. Diana, all these people. But they'll ask you to play. With the guitar on, dear, you're inviting it. All I can say is thank heaven. That they'll ask you to play? No, that the damn thing isn't a ukulele. You'll only make things worse. Hurry up, hurry up, everybody, and meet your new relative. Dear son-in-law, meet your cousins-in-law. Uh, we met earlier. Uh, charmed, I'm sure. He is good-looking, isn't he? Difficult to tell. Guitar's in the way. Oh, how nice. Going to play for us, eh? Of course he is. Else why the guitar, silly? Oh, but I'm not. Children, children, do sit down and let our little mother serve the coffee. Sit over here on the sofa with me, Mitzi. What are you going to play, Derek? Oh, um, I, uh, well, uh, I'm sorry, I don't play. I was only examining the instrument. Oh, then give it to Heinrich. He's learned a new Spanish fandango that I'm crazy to hear. I don't know it too well. If you take it off, I'll give it to him. Oh, well, very well. Here. 
beautiful guitar, isn't it, my boy? Very dressy. Oh, rather. Wait a minute before you sit down. First time we've had a chance to look at you without guitars and things to interfere. Oh, not just now. Uh, Heinrich's going to play. Heinrich, we're waiting. Damn, sorry. Can't play now. Can't do anything without a G-string. Just how I feel myself. <coughs> ah, here comes Aunt Minna. Everyone rises expectantly, all but Derek. He finds himself unable to move. He has rather the ostrich-like feeling that by crouching low, he will escape unnoticed. Aunt Minna enters, stalking grandly, naked, in from the undressing room. She is a gaunt dowager with a beautiful shawl draped about her shoulders. She carries a sketch pad and uses a walking stick. First, I lost my shawl, then my sketchbook. That's why I'm late. Oh, quite all right, Aunt Mina. <laughs> well, where is he? Produce him, my new nephew. Yeah. Which one? My eyes aren't as good as they once were. Derek, stand up. You've got her chair. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Uh, How do you do? Hmm. So, this is it? The man of your choice? Yes, Aunt Minna. This is Derek Leet. A little pale? But he'll do. You may kiss me, young man. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, oh, thanks awfully. Just a peck. But let that pass. Uh, here, take this chair, Aunt Minna. I fully intend to, when I'm ready. You know... I think I'll do you an oil. Over by the fireplace. Do me an oil? It sounds as though you're going to cook me. Going to do what? Well, cook me or treat me like a sardine or pour it over me with a dash of vinegar. Perhaps on the principle that a little French dressing is better than nothing. I do not make puns. Derek, Aunt Minna is a great artist. Anglo-Saxon humour. <laughs> no, I won't do him in oil. After all. Oh, thanks awfully. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry. No, I shall draw him instead. A charcoal might be nice. I like the flow of him, from his shoulders to his thighs. I'll do it in the garden, after tea. You'll draw me like this? You act as though I were going to draw and then quarter you. Well, well, that's a pun. I was only showing you that anyone can do it. It's a very cheap. You're in rare form today, Aunt Minna. I am always in rare form. I tell you what, let's all go outside and I'll take the engagement picture with Derek and Diana in the center. Oh, you're kidding. You couldn't get it developed, much less printed. Printed? Why, the notice magazines will be proud to publish it. Am I not president of our club? We'll have it on the newsstands in no time. Come, everyone, let's adjourn to the garden. No, I mean, I can't. I'm not going through with it. Photographs, groups, never. I'm done. What did you say? Derek! I've got a confession to make. You all think I'm one of you, but I'm not. I'm a wolf in sheep's clothing. I mean, a sheep with no clothing. You don't know what you're saying. I know, but I know what I'm feeling. And I've never been through such an embarrassing tea party in all my life. Never! Nothing that is natural can be embarrassing. You don't any of you realize I'm a no limey tangeritarian to begin with. Donna Vetta, what's that? It's Latin, but it's also what all true Englishmen are. We don't like to be touched. Do not touch me, Adians, you might call us. We want our privacy. We want our shells just as lobsters do. We're helpless as oysters without. Shells are natural. Clothes are not. I'm sorry, but clothes are natural to me. Unless I have my trousers to think in, I can't think. But this teapot of yours, it's like being in one big horrible bathroom together, like so many worms in a pail. How dare you speak like this to us, this lovely home, a horrible bathtub? Are you comparing me to a worm in a pail? And me? Oh, no. Oh, no. I don't know. It's, it's all such a nightmare from which I don't seem to wake. All right, silence, please. Silence. Do you mean to say... After being admitted to Arcadia, that you find our home, that you find us objectionable. Derek, how could you? I'm sorry, Diana. I tried to go stark naked to please, but I've gone stark mad instead. You know what this means if you don't go through with it? Yes. 
I know. I do love you, Diana, with all my heart. But uh, I can't. He turns and dashes behind the screen. Like a snake. Yes, a snake. He crawls amidst us. An imposter. His heresy befouls this very air. What the hell did he mean, embarrassing? A horrible bathtub. Look what you've brought upon us, worms in a pail. I'm sorry. I hoped it, it's no use. I was wrong. My poor baby. I must go to her. No, it's a lesson she needs. Let her fight it out alone. Oh, dear. Whatever did she mean? She's a rude, emotional child. You've been too lenient with her, Perseus. And I did not like his ribs. You want to paint him. <laughs> How dare you bait me, this younger generation. I would have skipped his ribs. And his skin, white, like grass under a plank. <clears throat> the reptile, deceiving my little snowdrop. Never felt so contaminated in my life. I would open the windows if they weren't already open. Our free corporeal culture. Just worms in a pail. Let's throw him in the pond. No, 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 no. He is our guest. He has broken bread with us. It was cake, dear, which he wouldn't eat. And he has given us mud in return. I know, dear. Derek suddenly reappears from behind the screen, having by this time put on his trousers and one sock. Slipping his suspenders into place over his bare shoulders. There. Fortified with trousers, perhaps I can explain. I can't let this go any further. You've all been wonderful to me, and I want to take back the worms. Then I'll continue with my dressing and leave you in peace and comfort the way I found you. It's too late to take back the worms, my boy. Ah, but they just slipped out. I lost my head, that's all, along with my trousers. Please accept my apologies, all of you. Personally, I think it's awfully jolly to be able to go prancing about the way you do, clothed in a smile. First we were worms, now we prance. Forget the worms, my little birdling. The boy has apologized. Let us be gracious enough to accept. I was only speaking figuratively. Good old Adam and Eve stuff. I tried it out today. Peaked in the garden, as it were. But I just don't seem to belong. What say you, Aunt Minna? Well, since you've taken back your worms, I'll give back your ribs. Good. And no hard feelings, anyone? Ah, uh, excellent. You know, if you ask me, for the first time, I think Derek's done extraordinarily well. Coming out parties are difficult. I'd say he was born to it. <laughs> yes, good old birthday clothes. But I don't like them. You mustn't be discouraged. Anything's awkward the first time. I was terribly nervous when Diana asked me to join the group. Astonishing how quickly you get used to it, Derek. You're all being kind, and I'm grateful. But I'm sorry. It's no use. I could never feel right having so many arms and legs and uh, things in the presence of ladies. Once you're decently suntanned, you won't mind. Well, I'm afraid I should, most awfully. You see, I'm an Englishman. Well, you chaps are free to turn your backs on the past and try out new theories. We can only do what our grandfathers did. It's in us. And did your grandfathers ever address a mixed gathering with their ribs showing? <laughs> my boy, you're stepping out. There's hope for you yet. Yes. But whenever my grandfather stepped out, they stepped right back in again, as I do now. I thank you. He disappears behind the screen once more. <sighs> Very sporting of him. But what a pity. Just the one to belong to our call. Too English. Takes to fig leaves like a duck to water. Tailor-made men, the British. Diana suddenly appears from the undressing room. Her manner is determined. There is a gasp of astonishment. <gasps> they all look at her. She is dressed. Diana! Diana! What does this mean? Take off those clothes. No, Aunt Minna. You defy me, young lady. Yes. I shall disinherit you. Well, go ahead. You foolish old woman, I wish you would. I'm sick of your threats and your tyranny anyhow. At least I'd be rid of having to kowtow every time you enter a room. And I'd be rid of having to admire your painting and going into ecstasies every time you finish a new one, which is usually as bad as the one before it. How dare you? 
I can't give him up. Why not? I love him. I'm going with him, just as Eve went with Adam out of the garden. He tried our ways and failed, but I can adopt his. I live in England, in the fog, and wear heavy tweeds and stout boots, <sighs> and have colds in the head all the rest of my life. <sighs> I'll be proper and have horrid thoughts about everything natural. <sighs> At least I'll try. I love him enough to try. I'm sorry, Aunt Minna. You talk hogwash. But I like your spirit, young lady. Diana, you will renounce the light. You will live in the dark, like a potato in a bin. Yes, if he wants to be a mere clothes horse man, I'm willing to be a mere clothes horse woman. No, Diana. Derek suddenly rushes from behind the screen, holding his trousers in front of him. You shan't sacrifice your principles. With a fine gesture of renunciation and heroic determination, he flings his trousers behind the screen and strides towards her, dressed in one sock. They mean more to you than clothes do to me. Besides, your father's right. All of you are. I'm getting used to it. My second wind. Oh, Derek, do you really think you can go through with it? Watch me. I'll just grin and bear it. Oh! Oh! So that was Barely Proper uh, by Tom Cushing, originally written and published in 1931. This was a radio adaptation by Leonard Lerman, which he did in 1991 for its world premiere at Camp Barrett in Pennsylvania on June 20th, 1992. The cast consisted of Jan Long, who played Derek Leet, Hélène Williams, who played Diana Schmidt, Peter Allison, who played Agamemnon Schmidt, Jay Serdula, who played Heinrich von Meinheim, Leonard Lerman, who played Herr Professor Perseus von Schmidt, Diane Archambault, who played Frau Elise Schmidt, Beverly Hicks, who played Mitzi Barr, Etty van Dyke, who played Aunt Mina, and Eda Regenaz, who played Katinka the Maid. And of course, as you probably recognize, the narrator was played by none other than myself. Stéphane Deschain. As it turns out, by a very surprising coincidence, Jan Long wasn't just anybody. Uh, he happened to be at the beach that day, and uh, he happened to volunteer when Leonard was asking for volunteers uh, to play the parts during this radio play. But Jan Long had played this hundreds of times already. He was actually a, a professional or semi-professional actor uh, because he played it um, at Circle H Ranch in New Jersey in 1965-66. Uh, um, and he also played it at Seminole Health Club in Florida in 1970-74. Uh, Circle H Ranch is no longer uh, in existence, and Seminole Health Club, while it exists, unfortunately, has turned into a swingers club. But not to take anything away, uh, we, we were incredibly fortunate to have Jan here uh, with all his experience, he didn't have to uh, really read the script because he still remembered it all those years later. So after we did the play, I sat down with Jan and I decided to uh, find out a little bit more about his history with this play. Yes, of course. Uh, on stage uh, many, many times, probably 400 times. <laughs> uh, and it started in New Jersey at Circle H Ranch, Nudist Camp. In well, when we first put it on, it was in 1964. No, I'm sorry, 1965, and um, for two years, 65 and 66, and um, we had uh, extremely good audiences. They were very responsive, and uh, I can't remember what the publicity was, but a lot of people came from New York City. In fact, people recognized me on the street from having seen me in the play. Um, and then I went off, I was in the a Coast Guard pilot, and I was transferred from uh, Brooklyn to uh, Naples, Italy. And I was there for three years, got transferred from there to Miami, and I just happened to have a copy of the script, 
and joined um, the Seminole Health Club in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, they built a stage, as they did in, at the Circle Age Ranch. Uh, it accommodated, I don't know, 400 people maybe. And it was filled every night. Well, we did it on weekends, like Friday and Saturday nights, for four years, from uh, basically from 70, uh, 1970 to 74. So they charge for the performances? Oh, yeah. My God. Well, I think they charge like $20, something like that, in those days, which is decent. Um, among other things, they had uh, in downtown Fort Lauderdale, they had mystery bus tours where they didn't tell people where they were going and they would bring them out. But everybody, everyone seemed to love it. And we opened up the pool and the whole, all the facilities for the audience after the play was over. And uh, The people who came were not just naturists? No, not at all. Just regular public. So did they have to strip off to use the facilities? Oh, no, no. They, to jump in the pool they had to, but they could wander around clothed for two or three hours after because it was... We'd, we kept it open from well, after the play from, say, 9.30 until midnight. So it obviously made money. Did it also get new members for the clubs? As I, as I recall, it went from 200 to 2,000, the membership, over, over that period of time. So it was, very, it was an extremely successful publicity thing. Uh, we also made a full-length feature movie out of it. Even though the play is only about, say, 25 minutes long, a uh, script was written to expand it so it would be a, could be a feature-length movie, and it had kind of natural national dis- distribution. Uh, however, the, the play itself was very good, but the what was written out around it was not very good, so it wasn't very successful. It's been a few years since you last did it. Like 30, what, 35, 36 years. How did it feel to do it again? Wonderful, wonderful. I mean, all the lines are in my head. Um, Len slightly changed it, I guess, up, updated or something, or, or changed it to his way of thinking. Um, so it was a little difficult today because some of the lines were different enough that, <laughs> but I, I could recite the lines from my play anytime, anywhere, right now. <laughs> Well, that's all again for this episode of The Naturist Living Show. Thank you again for listening. My name is Stéphane Deschain. I'm your host for this podcast and the owner of Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. You can find links to all the items I mentioned in the show notes on the website at naturistliving.bearoaks.ca. That's B-A-R-E, of course, and .ca because we're in Canada. Please keep sending your comments and suggestions. I always appreciate them. The show's email address is naturistliving at bareoaks.ca. Again, that's B-A-R-E and .ca because we're in Canada. Join us again in about a month for the next episode of The Naturist Living Show. This episode of The Naturist Living Show was brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. Traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Traditional values means that naturism is more than just taking your clothes off. It is a life philosophy with physical, psychological, environmental, social, and moral benefits. Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park strives to promote those naturist values in a modern setting that provides the amenities and services that our members and visitors expect. Free your body, free your mind. Learn more at www.bearoaks.ca.
We hope you enjoyed this video. As we said at the beginning, podcasts are much more convenient when you subscribe and listen on a podcast app. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Stitcher, Deezer, Overcast, and many, many other places. Please visit naturistlivingshow.com for more information on how to subscribe. 